a humble privilege to be part of this. It's a humble privilege to be on the board and watch this wonderful Mata Research Institute develop and make a big impact, not only in Gisborne, Tarafati, but also at Hira, New Zealand. And I just want to say you've done a wonderful job. And um, what you've done up so, up so far is incredible. What you're going to do in the future is going to be even more exciting. We're going to hear about that today. So, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I would, um, I'm just going to take on a bit of a journey of discovery in our brain research and highlight some of the major innovative and um, opportunities and milestones which have helped us develop our brain research at the Centre for Brain Research and to put it on the world stage. It's been a humble, humble journey to date and it's wonderfully exciting. And you know, a lot of the opportunity comes with serendipity. It's, it's about things happen and you just take the occasion, you grab with it when the opportunity comes. Don't ask too many questions and that's really what we've done. And I'm just going to outline some of the, some of the wonderful opportunities we have had and how that's taken on roads and journeys we never ever expected. So, um, you know, I first saw this human brain as a young third year medical student at Otago University and being a young Karanaki boy, um, Ngāti Raheri Te Ateau, I looked at that and I thought, oh boy, wow, is that, that's just something else. And I've got to say, I fell in love with that brain. That was 1967, the same year I fell in love with my wife, actually. I uh, married her five years later. But, um, and um, the, both journeys are incredible. So I thought, well, I'd like to do a bit of research on it. So I took a year out of the medical student, then I, and I actually took a year and did research on, you couldn't do it on the human brain, did it on the rat brain, and looked at the basal ganglia. And it was incredible. Found a new pathway. And that really stirred the research up inside me. Um, I thought, should I do a PhD? And uh, my professor said, no, finish medicine, come back later. So I finished medicine, tried neurosurgery, and then decided that was so much more we needed to know about the brain, then went back and started a PhD. PhD at Auckland University, then postdoc studies in the USA and um, Harvard, MIT in San Francisco, two and a half years, three, three and a half years rather, and learned new techniques and came back to New Zealand and started to apply that to my own brain research on the rat brain again. And then something happened which changed my life forever. I was looking at the basal ganglia, see the areas which are involved with Huntington's and Parkinson's disease. And uh, Professor Genetics came to see me and he said, Arthur Veal, he said, listen, Richard, you're working on the basal ganglia. I'm looking after all these wonderful families in New Zealand, out here in New Zealand, 400 families with Huntington's disease. It's caused by a gene. We can't test for the gene. But having this label is so impactful on their life. They have asked me if you would look at the brain of their mum and dad after they've died and just check to see whether the diagnosis was correct because we couldn't test for the gene. And so I said, sure. And um, so what happened is that, you see, families donated the brain of their mum and dad first to confirm or deny the diagnosis. In most cases it was yes, some cases it was no, which was amazing. But what they did, they said, keep mum's brain and do research on it. And so over the years, we have received the brains from people who have died with Huntington's disease throughout the whole extent of New Zealand, from Whangarei in the north and Vicargo in the south. And they said, um, you know, to do research on it, you, you, we, we'll try and get the brain to you as fast as possible after death. Um, if necessary, we'd love to give you the whole history of the whanau and so on. And, and so we ended up forming a partnership with the Huntington's families and they gave us the most invaluable gift of science you can ever give, the brain of their loved one. And that turned my research from the rat to the human brain and that's where I've been ever since. And we've made some wonderful discoveries from just looking, examining and using new and different techniques from every aspect, looking at the brain of people who died with Huntington's disease for a start. And, um, you know, the pathology is very clear cut. We were able to say, yes, definitely, this shows a section through the human brain of the person who died with Huntington's disease with a atrophic basal ganglia. This is a normal brain. 
and um, the looking at the brain, and we saw some most fascinating findings we would never have expected. We saw right next door to the ventricle, you see, right here, we saw this work with Morris Curtis and other postdocs did with us. We saw lying right along the ventricle here, we saw proliferation of cells. And I said to one of my colleagues, Mike Dragonoff, God, Mike, this, I think these are new brain cells. He said, no, can't be. You know, human brain doesn't make new brain cells. Uh, rats, cats, and monkeys do, but not humans. And so we did lots of studies, and we actually demonstrated unequivocally that, in fact, they were making new brain cells. These were immature cells which were growing, trying to replace the cells which had been lost in that adjacent striatum. And um, so, um, of course, it was a bit of a challenge because, you see, not everyone believed us. And, we, and so we even found the pathway which these cells actually, the way, the, the, the motorway which they followed from the basal ganglia all the way down to the olfactory bulb. And we call this the motorway of, motorway of neurogenesis. And um, we tried publishing in Nature. They said, no, we don't believe this. The referee said, no, you know, no such thing as new brain cells in the, in the human brain. And so um, we went to science after adding more information and more studies to it. And we finally got it accepted in science. And it went onto the front cover. And it changed the world. In fact, it was pretty, pretty challenging because um, many did not believe us. It was revolutionary. It was controversial to say that the human brain can make new brain cells and that it was plastic, and that the brain was continuously changing. But the big labs, they repeated the findings, and they, they agreed. They, they said, yes, this is in fact the case. And so we went on. And so that meant all the animal studies, you see, were relevant now to the human brain, because we, lots of studies have been shown in the animal that, but first, we know the rat makes new brain cells. We know if you if exercise and stimulate, and, the, the, the rat brain that, in fact, will make more new brain cells. And so, um, uh, and the same probably applies to human, to you today. You know, simulate creative thinking, we like to believe, makes new brain cells. And use it or lose it is what it's all about. So, um, and our studies on the Huntington's brain, we showed lots of different aspects of uh, new ideas on the Huntington's brain. And um, we extended our brain bank to include not only Huntington's disease, but also Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and epilepsy. Neurological Foundation came on board, and they actually funded it. And so we call it the Neurological Foundation of New Zealand Human Brain Bank, and that, their support has actually been wonderful. It ended up as actually a world-class resource. We didn't realize at the time, but because we had close connections with the families, because we fed and talk, keep talking to the families to get more information, um, we had a huge support from families and far now across. Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so they, they ensured by joining a donor program that they would get the brain to us as fast as possible. So some tissue you see we end up getting within two and a half hours of death, mostly within 12, 15 hours. And so not only that, but when we, we devised techniques of how we should really preserve the human brain, cut it up into identifiable blocks from each of those functional regions, store it in very special ways, and so that, plus the fact that we knew the journey that each of these brains had been on, put our research, put our human brain bank, actually, as the best little brain bank in the world. And we've got over a 1,000 brains now. We've got tissue from, and we've got, um, you know, lots of bots, and we've got eight freezers, and it's a wonderful resource. It's the resource which has been the platform, the innovative platform, which has taken us to a completely new level. Um, and because of this tissue, of course, being so precious, being, being so unique in the world compared to the big brain banks overseas, we ended up with widespread collaborations throughout the UK, throughout Europe, throughout the USA and Canada. So, uh, and we continue these today in the most special way. So that really set our research in the CBR on a, on a platform of um, uh, innovation in many respects. And... Uh, in the late 1990s, I, there was a young Russell Snell who just come back from, just come back from Wales. He'd just been involved with a consortium um, in, between USA and Europe of finding the HD, finding the, the HD gene on chromosome four. They identified it. They cloned it. He came back to New Zealand. We got him back on a senior um, welcome fellowship, and he walked into my office and I said, Russell, what do you think we should do? 
to try and you know, build on what you've done. He said, well, we should take the human HD gene and we should put it not into the rat, but lots of people have put little parts of the gene into the rat and it hasn't really helped us very much. He said, we should go to the sheep. We've got plenty of sheep in New Zealand. Their brain is much more similar to the human brain and uh, we should put the gene into the sheep genome. And I said, well, that's a bit of a dream. And so we started. The HD gene, it's a big gene, 340 kilodollars. It's a massive gene. And so he got to work with his team at the University of Auckland and made constructs. And when we worked with Saudi in Australia, South Australian Research Development Institute in, in Adelaide, and they, had, they, they were a research institute specifically for making transgenic sheep of different human diseases. And so we sent them the construct, and they injected, they flushed, they flushed out the fertilizer over from the sheep they, after insemination. Then, they, um, then we injected the gene into about the 150 little in embryos in the lab, and, um, and this is over 15 years' work. And then we created transgenic sheep lines, and we ended up creating actually six lines where the gene had actually been incorporated and was being expressed to different degrees. There was one line which was the best line to follow up, and that was the Kiwi line. And so you see, we're now using that transgenic sheep, the HD transgenic sheep in Australia, to actually develop new ways to turn that gene off. Um, and so looking, looking back at our research at this stage, you see, what we, were, what we were exactly sort of doing was we were forming a multidisciplinary research team. Um, it didn't set out as a big plan, but this is the way it happened. We were working with patients and families in the community across Aotearoa and New Zealand. We were bringing in neuroscientists at the University of Auckland together to collaborate and work together with geneticists, with pharmacologists, and so on, right across the whole extent of the university. Anyone doing brain research was part of our, part of our team one day, and of course we were working with the clinicians in particular, neurologists and neurosurgeons across the in the Auckland City Hospitals. And um, so we were actually developing a, um, a team right across the university. And so we ended up calling this and, then, and launching it in 2009 as the Centre for Brain Research. And um, if the All Blacks had won the World Cup, well, we could have called it the All, All Blacks of Brain Research. But you know, anyway, we, are, we consider ourselves really the All Blacks of, of Brain Research. And, um, and this is what we are. That's our logo. The sort of schematic outline of the brain. You can see the, the enlarged um, you know, basal ganglia forebrain here arching round here going down towards the spinal cord. And this is the ventricular system in the middle. And if you look very carefully, you can actually see a kiwi there. And so what we are, you see, we are actually three pillars forming the Centre for Brain Research. We've got the researchers across the university. We've got the researchers across the university, we've got the clinicians in the hospital, we've got community organisations. And it's those three pillars which make up what we are, um, a multidisciplinary centre of brain research which reaches across the university, across into the hospitals and out to the, out to the people. Just some of our, our world-class neuroscientists there, and these are some of the school clinicians, you know, we've got neurologists, we've got... We've got neurosurgeons, we've got um, gene therapy people, come, Chris Shaw coming out from London to a new appointment, and this is Lynette Tippett here. Um, and these are our different, just a few of our community interactions. So the ambitious goals we had for the centre was, you know, we wanted to do world-class research, collaborative research, we wanted to be innovative, unlock the secrets, develop new therapies, improve clinical care, and most importantly, train scientists and clinicians and reach out and engage with the communities and educate and inform. And um, that's what we've been doing. And um, one of the critical developments we've done within the centre is to create platforms. And we've had so much support and help from different ph philanthropic groups, different trusts to actually set it up. I've told you about the Neurological Foundation, Human Brain Bank. It's, it's set up and funded by the Neurological Foundation. It's been expanded over the last few years. The Hugh Green um, Foundation has been wonderful to us. They have, they have given money to support our growing of human brain cells. This is by Mike Dragonoff, 
Um, he's led this team, and it's been wonderful, where we take small amounts of tissue, sometimes straight off the operating table, sometimes from post-mortem brains. We take it into the lab. We then digest the tissue, blocks of tissue, and in, in, in special conditions, we then grow and maintain these cells in our incubators and uh, form cell cultures, and then we use that to experiment and analyze on. So we can actually grow brain cells from healthy parts of the brain, from normal brains, and also, of course, from um, brains that have been affected by disease. And these brain cells, you see, we use to actually have a disease in addition to the lab, and we, um, we just use them for drug trials, drug trial in the lab, and I screen large groups of potential compounds, and we can actually grow most, we can virtually grow every sort of cell in the human brain, um, including neurons, and that's a feat which uh, um, not many labs can do in the world. So we've ended up being world leaders because of our access to human tissue, and that has been so innovative and so inspiring for um, our researchers. So, um, so our CBR platforms, apart from the Hugh Green Group and the, and the Brain Bank, we've, got, we've, we've developed additional groups over the years, a new discovery animal research where we do behavioral studies. Um, it's at the medical school. We've got a catwalk spinal cord injury unit funded by catwalk. And we've got the neurosurgery research unit funded by Freemason Douglas and, and Sir Graham Douglas's foundation and Sir David Levine. And the CBR Biobank was funded by Hugh Green Foundation. Huntington's Disease Transgenic Sheep Platform I've told you about, and that was funded by the Freemasons. They gave us money to do the stream because no one else in the world believed we could put such a big gene into the sheep, and we're now uh, well on the way to creating an Alzheimer's Disease Transgenic Sheep, putting the tau gene into the sheep, again doing this in Saudi and in, in South Australia. Um, and we have, we, have, we have a CBR celebration choir. This is this is a choir where people who have problems talking have problems with aphasia. We bring them together once a week and we do research on them as we see the effects of singing and how that helps repair the brain. And that's humbling and it works and it's wonderful. Um, we've also got funded postdoctoral research fellows from those various people. So David Levine has also funded the chair in brain research. And these are partnerships in brain research which are helping us to develop platforms and give hope for the people of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, most importantly, we're now reaching out and we're, we're developing what we call translational clinics. Translational clinics where we actually do research on people with the disease. The first one we developed with our core with um, the Brain Research New Zealand was our Dementia Prevention Research Clinic. We're, it's led by Lynette Tibbet. And here we enroll people in the very early stages of, of Alzheimer's disease, and we monitor them, we do research on them, we do imaging on them, and, and we, we really just do an intense scientific study on them, blood tests and the whole works. And then we see how we can slow down the progression of that disease. And um, if we can do that by different, com combining different forms of treatment, if we can slow down by five years, that would cut the incidence of uh, the prevalence of um, Alzheimer's by 50%. And, and, yeah, this has been going on for five years now, and it's well advanced, and it's doing, and it set the model for our other clinics. And so we've got a stroke recovery clinic by, with Ellen Barber leading it, looking at and looking at people with stroke, looking at people who have had their clot retrieval, and, and, and just seeing how we can improve that through, through research. Motor neuron disease is another research clinic. Um, neurogenetics research clinic led by Associate Professor Richard Roxburgh, looking at those rare genetic diseases on people with the disease and doing research. And these are the ones which are in the pipeline now, which we're discussing. Some of them in, in association with Marti, our concussion and sports brain injury clinic is a critical one for this country. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a sports hungry country, and we need to make sure we play our sport in a way that looks after their brain, their most precious gift in life. Autism Research Clinic is being planned. Um, Russell Snell's heading that up with, with Jesse Jacobson because we've already shown that by, by looking and doing research on, on people with autism, you can, you can identify things that may help the whole behavioral profile of these people who have autism. Um, Gene Therapy Research Clinic, Chris Shaw's developing that, an MS Research Clinic, uh, Parkinson's, epilepsy, and, and so, 
you see, we've really gone from the early days when I just looked at the rat to the human and to the human people with the disease. Um, because the human brain is the last frontier. And we've got to make sure we turn this tide around and give people with brain disease in whatever form, brain injury, give them hope for the future. And so um, the people that have been able to, to do these, create these clinics, are listed there. You know, over, over our years, um, 13 years, 14 years of the CBI, we've received just over $50 million, which is just incredibly humbling. And these people believe in our cause, and they believe that what we're doing is, has potential for helping out here in New Zealand. And finally, what, we've, what I've been doing over the years is, <coughs> is going back to my whānau and my, and my iwi, back in Taranaki, because there's a big whānau down there with Huntington's disease. And, and since coming back from the US, I've gone down and slowly developed a close relationship, kept them up and, and go down on an annual basis, tell them what we're doing with the research and give them a bit of hope. And we're expanding this now. And we've actually expanded over the last couple of years and we're reaching out now. The only the way to engage Māori is that you don't ask them to come to the university. You get off your butt and you go out onto the MRI. You talk to them and you tell them and what, what research is offering. And then you listen to the problems they have and then you form a partnership with them. And it, and it is the most wonderful, humbling um, thing in the world. And um, you know, last weekend we were down in Invercargill. Um, yesterday I was up here in Tarafati. Um, and we've been up north, and Dr. Makarina Dudley, she's our Deputy Director Māori, and she leads us with our kamata to go out and to take our message to the people. And in a way, you know, that's the most innovative thing we could do, to take our message back to the people who actually live daily with brain diseases and give them a hope and give them a dream that it's going to be better for, hopefully for them, but certainly for the kids. So thank you very much for the wonderful privilege of speaking to you today.